Well, good afternoon. On a Wednesday afternoon, we're so excited to be able to share God's Word with you. Grab your coffee cup. I got mine. Most importantly, grab your Bible. And uh, we'll have a study of God's Word. We're going to be back in 1 Thessalonians again. Chapter 2, starting with verse 13, all the way up to chapter 3, verse 13. So, uh, in this next section of verses in 2 Thessalonians, we are, uh, there are questions we can ask the Bible, and I always encourage people to ask questions about the Scripture. It's okay to ask questions of the Scriptures. So my couple of questions that I want to ask today are, how did the church in Thessalonica receive the Word of God? And the second question is, who did they hear it from? Well, these are obvious questions. The answer to the second question was, they heard the gospel from Paul and Silas. And we all have opportunities that are put our way quite often that we could share the gospel. Paul and Silas were not afraid to share the gospel, despite persecution. The church was born, Thessalonican church, if you remember from other studies that we did, was born in much strife and conflict. But how did the Thessalonican church people receive the word of God that was spoken to them? Did they accept it in spite of the conflict? Or did they reject it? Paul says they accepted it for what it was. That it was not the words of men. Now, that's very important. That we, It's always in dispute that people claim that the Bible is just the words of men. No, it is the word of God. And that's how they accepted it. What is this word that was spoken to them capable of doing? As he says in his verse, it performs its work in you who believe. So what effect did the response of the church have on Paul and Silas? They said they constantly thank God that they received the word of God for what it really was. Not words from men, but from God. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to use the word of God to transform us. And that was the hallmark of the church in Thessalonica. They accepted the gospel that Paul and Silas preached them as the word of God. Now there are people across the world. I have with me a copy of the Voice of the Martyrs. This is the most recent copy and it's all about the Bible. And what they're looking for is people to send money so they can get Bibles to people, new believers across the world, where Bibles in restricted or forbidden book and they need Bibles so that for the new believers who are coming to faith in Christ. So we have an opportunity to share with Voice of the Martyrs, if you're so willing, to buy Bibles for these believers, these new believers who desperately need the Word of God. And they have to be smuggled in because it's forbidden to have a Bible in a lot of these places. Because Satan knows that the Word of God has power to transform people's lives through the Holy Spirit. And that's what, uh, in John 16, 13, Jesus said, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Satan knows that the Bible, the Word of God, is God's truth. He doesn't want us to know it. Or he wants to twist it. So when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide us into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose it to you, to you what is to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and will disclose it to you. So here we go. You know, the Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and puts it in our hearts and makes it come alive to us in ways that we never could imagine. You know how it is. Sometimes you read a scripture over and over many times, and you, yeah, okay, and you go on to the next one. But sometimes it really hits you. It really impacts you. And when that happens, that's the Holy Spirit quickening that word as, so that you can hear it and understand it. In John 14, 16, the Holy Spirit is the helper. The Greek word here is parakletos, or a more English version is paraclete. Now I jokingly say, no, not a parakeet, but a paraclete. That means he is the one who comes alongside of us. I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper. That will, He may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see Him or know Him. 
But you know him because he abides with you and he will be within you. Blessing for us then in all of this is that the, the God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the hearts of every believer and transforms and changes us. Pat and I love to watch sometimes these home makeover things, you know, like Fixer Upper or Home Makeover Extreme Edition or something. You know, there's lots of uh, homes on homes and all this different ones that are uh, on TV these days on, on the cable or, inter or satellite. And they'll take an old rundown house or, or a cabin or something and fix it up into a beautiful home. That's a crude illustration of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. Except he puts to death the old nature. He tears down the old nature and brings forth a brand new nature. So that he doesn't try to rebuild what's there. He already has put to death that old nature, that old person that used to be in. Now he brings forth a brand new person. And that's what it means to be born again. In the next few verses, Paul praises the Thessalonica church because they were imitators of other churches that endured persecution. For you, brethren, have become imitators of the churches of God in Christ, that in Judea, uh, Christ Jesus, that in Judea, for you also endured the same sufferings, suffering at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. Jesus said in John 15, 18, Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. And we see that ramping up across the world today. Hatred for, for believers is really, really ramping up. Verse 20. If they persecute me, they will also persecute you. So Paul saw these people who were causing trouble, not only displeasing to God, but that they hindered the apostles from speaking the gospel message to the Gentiles so that they might be saved. They were hostile towards men, and thereby the wrath of God was upon them to the utmost. Paul, when he was still Saul, thought he was doing the Lord's work when he was persecuting the church. And he was on his way to Damascus, as we said before. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute believers there, and he met Jesus on the road. And then he came to realize he was persecuting Jesus. So many today, they think, think that they're doing God's work by persecuting Christians, when in reality, they're heaping up God's wrath upon themselves instead. Verse 17, Paul expressed his desire to see the believers in the church again to see how they fared in the face of this persecution that they endured and to encourage them. And we all need encouragement from time to time, don't we? We all need to have an encouraging word read to us or said to us, someone call us or I had a phone call this afternoon from our dear brother Steve Oswald and he always calls to encourage me and I, I really appreciate that. We brethren, but we brethren haven't been taken away from you for a short while in person, not in spirit, we're all the more eager with great desire to see your face. We can all identify with that. We've been out of the church now seven weeks. We've been doing this uh, Bible study for four weeks. So this is the fourth week. And, we, you know, we all long to get back together to see each other, to see each other's face. And I hope that will happen someday sooner than later. So many have expressed to me that they, they really want to get back to church, and I have that great desire myself. Paul said this for a different reason. However, even in our times, we can still call each other up, send cards, and do whatever we can to encourage each other as believers. And I know many of you are doing that, and thank you so much. Many people only see the physical realm of things that go on around us. But there's an unseen spiritual realm as well. The Apostle Paul had a razor keen insight into the spiritual workings of the enemy in what happened in Thessalonica. And in verse 18 he says, For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. A person would have to almost be blind not to see the forces of darkness at work around us. And not only with the virus, 
but with all the activities, those things, the people who kill and dismember people, throw their bodies in the landfill, it's horrible things. Murder is the ultimate act of hate. It started when Cain killed Abel out of jealousy that Abel's offering was accepted in and his, his was not. Murder and every source of unrighteous activity have been going on ever since. It's the reason God brought a flood on the earth, because God saw that the, every thought and intention of people's hearts was only evil. Genesis 6, 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of men was great on the earth, and every thought of the, and intent of the heart was only evil continually. So that was the reason why God brought the flood. The Lord, he said he was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. That is one thing that grieves the Lord the most, is our sin. And that is why he made provision through his son Jesus to deal with the sin and provide a way for mankind to be saved through the blood of the cross. One thing that brings joy to the heart of the Lord is a faithful and thriving church. Verses 19 to 20. For who is our hope, or our joy, or crown of exaltation? Is it not you, the presence, in the presence of the Lord Jesus that is coming? For you are our glory and joy. In the letters to the seven churches, singling out now the church of Philadelphia, heard this word from the Lord Jesus in Revelation 3, verses 8 to 11. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door which no one can shut, because you have because you have a little power, and kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and make them know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I will also keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, so that no one will take your crown. Well, there's a lot to learn from that scripture, from the word that the Lord gave this church. And the first one is, I know your deeds. Since the church isn't the building, it is the people. He knows our deeds. As Psalm 39 says, He knows our thoughts from afar. He knows our rising up and our sitting down. He scrutinizes our ways. For those, of us, those who think that this is threatening, they don't want God to know what they're doing. But for those of us who are believers in Christ, it is comforting that God knows everything about us. There's nothing about you that He doesn't know already. You can't hide anything from Him. There's, he knows everything about you, and guess what? He still loves you. Isn't that comforting to know that? He has also placed an open door for us as a church to empower us to do his work. And the good news is that even though Satan might try, and he will, no one can shut that door. Thirdly, if we remain true to his word and have our robes washed clean, he will keep us from the hour of testing that's coming on a whole world. That is the tribulation, by the way, that he's referring to. That means to me that the rapture will occur before the tribulation starts. I certainly hope it does. And I, and I think the biblical, this is one of the proof texts for it, that the rapture will occur before uh, the tribulation starts. It actually will usher in the tribulation. There are many who disagree with that. Salvation doesn't hinge on the fact whether we disagree or agree with it. Many people around the world are already going through severe persecution. It's in this book, The Voice of the Martyrs, you can read about. And you can get this free if you just ask for it online. Or you can get it online yourself. So many people are going through severe persecution. But they will have a crown and a reward laid up in heaven for them. Paul had an ache in his heart to know how the church had fared. Did they survive? Or had they fallen away? Jesus gave the parable of the sower. In Matthew chapter 13, and one of the places seed was sown 
was among the rocky places. Remember, there were four types of soils. And he gave the explanation of this. Is the man who hears the word of God and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. Paul was afraid that this might have happened to this church. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 now, we're going to switch into chapter 3, we read this. Therefore, when, when we could endure it no longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother, and God's fellow worker in the gospel of Christ, to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith, so that you would not be disturbed by these afflictions. And so it came to pass, as you know, that we have been destined for this. But what did Paul mean by that? Paul expected persecution. But these were brand new believers. Did they fall away? Verse 4, Paul reminds them that he warned them that this was going to happen. And he says this, For indeed, when we were with you, we kept telling you in advance that we are going to suffer affliction. And so it came to pass. Paul told the church in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 4, 11 to 13. He describes the life as, as an apostle, and for many believers around the world, they experience this too. To this present hour, we are both hungry and thirsty. We are poorly clothed and roughly treated and homeless. We toil, working with our own hands. When we are reviled, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we try to conciliate. We have become the scum of this world, the dregs of all things, even to now. Timothy brought back a good word of a vibrant and healthy church that comforted Paul and Silas. I will read these, read these last three verses in closing, verses 5 to 7. For this reason, when I can endure it no longer, I also sent to find out about your faith, for fear that the tempter might have tempted you, and our labor would have been in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and brought us good news of your faith and love, so that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us, as we also long to see you. For this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we are comforted about you through your faith. So the church comforted, you know, good news about the church comforted them in their affliction. They were, they were uh, still a little shaken probably from the treatment they had endured. They were now in Athens. But Timothy brought back good word that the church had not only survived the persecution, but had thrived during the persecution. Okay, I'll like. I want to read a couple of verses more from verses 11 to 13 in chapter 3 in closing instead. Why? Because there's good instruction for you in these verses, and I encourage you to read them again and again. Now may the Lord, now may our God and Father himself, and Jesus, our Lord, direct our way to you, and may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another. So there's the first word of instruction. That we increase and abound in love for one another. And for all people, just as we all do for you. Now here's the next word of instruction. So that you may establish your hearts without blame and holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus. So Christ wants to have a bride, the church, that is without spot or wrinkle. So he wants to establish us in holiness and without blame before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. That is a fitting end to this study. It is a clear word of instruction from Paul to encourage you today. And as, as I said, read it over and over again because you'll, you'll gain instruction from it, you'll gain encouragement from it. And I hope you continue to be encouraged by these, uh, by these studies and uh, may you have a great week. Well, I'm going to close in prayer. Father, we thank you today for your word that does encourage us and does instruct, instruct us in how we are to live our lives, Lord. Not only can we learn from these churches that endured persecution, Lord, we can also um, 
learn from what they endured and how they faced up to it. Because we know, Lord, one day uh, persecution will come at a greater level to this country. How do we respond? Or we've had it pretty nice. We haven't had much persecution in this country. There have been some freedoms people have tried to take away from us, Lord, but we still have the freedom to meet and, and do the things that, we, uh, like this video today, where it be illegal in a lot of countries. Lord, so uh, just help us to rejoice in the freedoms we do have and, and Lord, put an end to this virus and all the things that are happening because of it, Lord, that we can start meeting again as a church. Bless the people at Lake Eunice and anyone watching this video today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll look forward again to a video on, uh, we'll put out again on Saturday for you to watch our Sunday service. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy the day. It's a beautiful one. God bless.